You're listening to Inside the Village, where all news is local and no topic is off limits. So help me, Bob, it's bully in the alley. Hey, hey, bully in the alley. So help me, Bob, Back for another episode of Inside the Village across the Village Media Network. With Michael Friscalanti, Editor-in-Chief here at Village Media. I'm Scott Sexsmith. Derek Turner, Executive Producer, is in the room as well. We're back for another week. Let's talk about last week's show for a second. And the feedback that we got through ITV at villagemedia.ca was off the charts. Yeah. Probably the most feedback we've had I think from so. any episode. I can think of a couple other episodes that had a lot, but this one, yeah, this is human composting we're talking about, right? Whether we yeah. should, the government should allow you to basically become compost after you die. Or as some people thought, burying dead bodies yeah, in well, your backyard. Yeah, well, that was the part of the feedback, right? <laughs> well, there was a few people that didn't quite understand that how, like, you know, Morgan was on the show talking about yeah. how they put you in this special <laughs> vessel for yeah. three months and you become soil with all the other stuff around you. And when people are like, "Wow, that's disgusting! You can't bury me in the backyard." You, we used to, what if someone buys your house? And I don't think no, they watch no. the episode. watch the whole thing and then yeah. and then read yeah. all the all but the. But it's words. we've talked about this before too. Death is a conversation that rattles a lot of people. They just to talk about it or to think, "Well, what's going to happen with me after I die? And what, what am I going to do?" It's such an emotional conversation. Oh, and people were really emotional in their feedback. Yeah, yeah. and then you got guys like the three of us that a week later are still talking about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, it was great, man. It was great. It was a good show. I. I uh, I, I really hope that it picks up steam, this this issue, because I yeah. know like the government's been looking at it for a few years. There's people in the industry that want to bring this into the bring this into existence in Canada. Yep. And I think there's enough people out there that would want to give it a shot. It's also there was a story today in the in the headlines about how the cost of dying is just out of control. How much it costs to die and have a funeral. Yep. This yep. is a little bit of a more cost of fes- effective way to do it. And you know what? Having, you know, the advantage of now a week or so to think about it, I think I'd be okay with it. Yeah. Absolutely. Why not? Why not? Wouldn't it be funny? Like when I just I just keep picturing that pickup truck load of soil. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> like the, you bring your own truck into the back of the the funeral home. And is just, it is it cheaper if you bring your own? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, then probably <laughs> probably is like if your friends shovel it. Is it cheaper? <laughs> Michael Friscalanti, two ninety eight Queen Street. <laughs> ITV at Village Media. Oh is that my what God. It is? ITV at Village Media. That's what it that's, is. Yeah, yeah. That's what it is. And I'll tell you one thing, as much feedback as we got last week on human composting, I would bet your bottom dollar, or maybe even your paycheck, that this week's episode will garner just as much, if not more, feedback as we talk about the measles vaccination with Dr. Don Bowdish from McMaster University. We'll get to that in a sec. Let's talk about the first word to Frisco. First off, Highway 400 being renamed in honor of Gordon Lightfoot. Possibly. There's a uh, big petition out. That's the uh, that's the petition that we've, we've been writing about it on a really matters. Greg McGrath Gowdy's been on it, but this petition has been gaining steam for a while. Mm-hmm. I believe it was first brought up when he first passed away, if I remember right. Yeah, people were talking yeah. about that as an option. How do we properly remember this icon? Um, and it's been picking up steam. Like I said, there's more and more signatures every day uh, on this petition. It, it's an interesting idea, and we've talked about it a little bit, right? I mean. He's certainly a, a huge figure in Canadian music and somebody that's beloved by so many. Um, but it's a difficult question about you just, when you try to figure out who do you rename a major Canadian I highway know. after, right? I mean, that's it's all right. This is already this highway a portion of it's already the Highway of Heroes in honor right. of Canadian uh, forces members who've been killed in, in overseas missions. Uh, so there's that aspect of it as well. And, you know, it's an uncomfortable question, but as some people have brought up, and I believe there's a letter to the editor today in Aurelia about it, is who's going to pay for this, right? And there's some costs involved. In of that. course. And is it worth that? Just the signage alone, right? Yeah. Is, is, it wor- is it worth that cost? I mean, I, I love Gordon Lightfoot. I thought his music was amazing. He was a huge figure in this country. But, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great debate. What do you think? Well, I'm with you. I don't know what, what the criteria should be. You know, how do, how do you qualify as somebody that, you know, should have a landmark or a building or a highway named after you? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, if, if, if anybody should, he certainly, uh, you know, contributed immensely uh, to Canadian uh, music. Uh, certainly to the Mariposa Folk Festival yes. uh, in Aurelia. Uh, I don't know. I mean, as Derek so eloquently pointed out, uh, he did uh, perform the song Carefree Highway, uh, so it is only fitting that yeah. he should have a highway that, named yeah. after him. That one's certainly not a carefree highway, though. It is not. <laughs> it is the least. It is care- a be careful on that highway. Yeah, it's the least carefree highway, I think. It's <laughs> great. A lot of crazy people there on, a, on the, the holiday weekends. So. Absolutely. Okay, uh, to Timmins we go, and a uh, fire at a landmark building there, the uh, what used to be the Empire Hotel, uh, and some terrific reporting by our team there, Maya Hoggett and Amanda Rabsky-McCall. Yeah, this broke out over the weekend. Uh, this complex was originally the Empire Hotel, built in 1925, so almost 100 years ago. A pretty historic building in Timmins, and it's always 
um, shocking when you see a major fire in your community, but it's even more shocking when it's a historic building that has a lot of mm-hmm. uh, a, a lot have people have a lot of relationship with in the community. So again, our team, like we usually do, as we always do, we covered it well. We were there on the scene. We covered it throughout the couple of days that the fire was burning. Uh, very cold temperatures in Timmins at the time. So yes. the firefighters battling the blaze and the cold. Um, thankfully, nobody was hurt. Uh, nobody was killed. Uh, uh, but a hundred people though were displaced, and they're you know finding alternative al- alternate accommodations at the moment. Not quite sure what's going to happen to them, but it's going to be a while. Uh, I guess the silver lining is uh, you probably saw the headline. There was multiple cats found in the yeah, building a yeah. few days later, uh, which you know brought some smiles to some people's face. But yeah, definitely. Uh, it's always a challenge to cover these these types of these types of fires when they happen. But again, especially when it's a building with such historic significance. All right, and finally uh, to Fergus and reporter Keegan Kozalanka, and an interesting story about a gentleman receiving a, a bit of an odd tax bill. Yeah, this one's great, right? This is the I think the story goes that he lives in a townhouse complex with about forty or fifty other units. And he was mailed a quarterly bill for five cents as part of his common element fees, right? And, you know, we all joke about our taxes being too high, but this is almost ridiculously low. As he pointed out, it costs more to send the bill than it does to yeah. pay it. Which is a stamp is, is well yeah. over a dollar yeah. now. Yeah, but the photo is the best part of the story because he just kind of looks like the photo goes, what the hell is this kind of look on his face? <laughs> I'd love to know how is he paying? Is, is he showing up with a quarter and yeah. asking for change back? Is it a yeah. nickel? Five yeah. pennies? Yeah, you have to read the story to find out. There you go. Do you still use nickels? Uh, I don't, but you and I were just talking. I, we, we, we've got a change jar, you mm-hmm. know, quarters, nickel, yeah. you know, just dump them in there and they just yeah. kind of sit. Yeah. But there's not a lot of dumping going on because outside of loonies and toonies, yeah. really. And really not a lot of grabbing either. Like, I don't know, we don't ever, no. we have the same one in our drawer in the kitchen and it's been there, probably the same change there for a couple of years. Yeah, yeah. But it, uh, but it is interesting. I guess uh, we could all celebrate though if we had a five cent bill come in the mail. I guess it's better than 500 bucks. Absolutely. I would uh, sign up for that, for sure. Okay, uh, Dr. Uh, Don Bowdish, today's guest. She is the executive director of the, I want to get this right because it's a long title, executive director of the Fireside Institute for Respiratory Health, professor of medicine at McMaster University in Hamilton. It's a big one, smart lady. We're going to talk measles, uh, which, as we know, is once a thing of the past, but uh, has reared its ugly head. And this is an, a discussion that we've seen a lot of in the last couple of months. It basically was eradicated in Canada, and it's yeah. starting to come back. And part of the reason is because not as many people are getting vaccinated with the childhood vaccines that we've had that you and I would have gotten yep. to deal with this. So we're going to have a discussion about vaccines, which always scares me because it's going to bring out People have such strong opinions about, yes. about vaccines. But the reality, Scott, is that school boards across the province, public health agencies are telling parents, your kid's going to be suspended if you don't have these childhood vaccines, which are mandated by law to have to go to school. It's not new. It's not, you know, post-COVID. It's been for decades. These, this law has been Absolutely. We all, I had it when I was a kid. Uh, some things went off the rails during COVID. People weren't getting the vaccinations they necessarily were going to get because there was so much demand on the system to deal yeah. with COVID. So public health agencies are trying to catch up now, right? So we've seen in Guelph where they just suspended 1,300 kids who aren't up to aren't up to uh, up to uh, aren't up to date on their vaccines. Yep. Here where we are in Sault Ste. Marie, the Algoma Public Health Unit has sent out about 4,000 letters to parents wow. saying. And this is after a year of warning parents, like, hey, yeah. you need to have this stuff. You need you need to get this done. And to be clear, you have to either A, have your vaccine or get an exemption. And you right. can get an exemption from your doctor for medical reasons. Some people are allergic to, to you know, some of these vaccines because they use eggs, for example. Yep. And you can also just get, you can get it on religious grounds or other grounds, but you have to get an affidavit style, signed by an official saying why you're doing this. So it doesn't mean you have to get the vaccine. No. But you have to have your stuff up to date. So right. Has, and if not, you're going to get suspended. So. Communities are kind of already bracing for what's going what's already happened in Guelph, right? Which is like you know hundreds, if not thousands, of kids are going to be told, as of this date, you're not going back to school until you get these vaccines. So, I'm a little bit scared about this conversation because <laughs> it's the reality is it's happening. We're yeah. going to talk about why it's happening and what you can do about it, but it's going to trigger a lot of people who are going to send me the same emails I've gotten before about how you know you're not you're not reporting the truth, you're lying, you're part of the government conspiracy, you're blah blah blah. All right, we got to get a break, and we're back with uh, Dr. Don Bowdish from McMaster University. When Inside the Village returns right after this. Reporters, editors, and journalists who go the extra mile to get the story and get it right. 
Go behind the scenes with those who cover the stories that matter most to you and your community. Look for it in the Village Features section of your favourite Village Media website across Ontario. When you need a mortgage, the right choice can really save you money and stress. With True North Mortgage, you'll get your best rate, better options and timely advice to help you save thousands. Bring home your best mortgage today with experts you can trust. Back on Inside the Village with Michael Friscalani, Editor-in-Chief here at Village Media. I'm Scott Sexsmith. Measles, once a thing of the past, but lately it's becoming a bit of a health threat of the present. And we're pleased to have on the program with us uh, today uh, Dr. Don Bowdish. Uh, Dr. Bowdish is the Executive Director of the Firestone Institute for Respiratory Health and Professor of Medicine at McMaster University in Hamilton. Professor, good of you to join us on Inside the Village. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, and thanks for covering this really important topic. It is important, and I think at last check, uh, we have around 24 active cases uh, of the measles in Canada right now. What's causing this? Uh, what factors have contributed uh, to these numbers? Measles is one of these rare pathogens that it is theoretically possible that we could completely eliminate. And to be one of those magical pathogens, like smallpox, you have to have a couple features. One of those features is you have to only infect humans. So for infections where there's like an animal that can pass it back and forth, you know, we're unlikely to ever be able to vaccinate all the animals in the world. So those ones don't tend to be something we could eradicate. But things like polio, measles, smallpox should in theory be something that we should be able to get rid of completely. Our vaccines work well, they give us long lasting protection. But the challenge with measles has always been that it's pretty much the most contagious virus we know of. And because of that contagiousness, you have to have at least 97% of the world vaccinated. Canada's, uh, countries like Canada, uh, we used to be able to say that we had eradicated measles. So when measles came to Canada, it almost always came from parts of the world where measles was still a problem. And those parts of the world tend to be places where like the childhood vaccination programs maybe were disrupted by war or civil unrest or, you know, major political things that meant that that vaccinations got disrupted. And now we're in a slightly different situation. So for the first time in a few uh, decades that I know of, we've actually had a case in Canada of what's called community transmission, meaning somebody got measles and we don't know where they got it from. So this is really worrying and it's 100% attributable to the fact that we don't have 97% vaccination coverage in Canada anymore. So it seems as though uh, infections are on the rise, particularly in Europe and in the United States. And of course, vaccin uh, vaccination rates uh, are declining. Is it because too many people are just dismissing this and, and thinking that it's a, it's a childhood infection only? I think there's a few things in play. In the 90s, and through the late 90s, there was a very organized misinformation campaign. And consequently, people were worried. And the epicenter of that really was the UK, where we're seeing lots of measles now. But the US was pretty much a close second. And so there was a little bit of mis not a little bit. There was a lot of misinformation that led to a, a generation to many people to miss that. And uh, and consequently, because people weren't afraid of measles, it wasn't something you normally saw. They felt it was safe not to vaccinate their children. But I will share with you one of the reasons we get so worked up about measles and get so concerned about measles is because unlike other respiratory infections like influenza or RSV, those are infections that you breathe them in and they infect the lining of your, your lungs mm -hmm. um, and they stay pretty local. Measles actually infects your immune cell. So it invades your lung immune cells. It takes the tour of your body as they go and tour around, infecting millions and millions of more cells, and it kills them. Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening is as many as one in 10 cases requires serious medical care because without your immune cells, you become so vulnerable to just normal bacteria that live sort of on and in you. In the antibiotic era that we are in, most people will recover from that. But even this is a bit more worrisome because after COVID, where there was so much antibiotic use for hospitalized patients, antibiotic resistance is on the rise. Mm -hmm. 
So we get really worked up because we know that all of these poor vulnerable people who get sick are going to need medical care. But by killing your immune cells, we also know that if a young a child gets um, gets measles, they're going to be more likely to get more sick with more things and need more antibiotics for at least five years after that initial infection. So measles is the opposite <laughs> of a harmless childhood infection. It's the polar opposite, but because we just don't have that memory or the experience. And I should also say the other group that I'm really worried about is those people who were born in the 90s and early 2000s, because mm-hmm. those are people who are reaching the age where they might be thinking about starting a family. And if they're not protected from measles and we give the vaccine for measles, mumps and rubella, they're now susceptible to infections during pregnancy. And measles and rubella used to be the top causes of congenital defects, uh, premature labor, serious complications during pregnancy. So again, we get worked up because the medical community and the scientific community is so well aware that the serious consequences this infection can have in young people or in pregnant people. Professor, can you remind us what the misinformation campaign was? What was it people were so concerned about or trying to spin? Yeah, I, uh, there was a very concerted, cynical, um, self-serving misinformation campaign linking measles vaccination and autism. Mm-hmm. And you still hear of this today and you still hear of people declining childhood vaccinations because of this misinformation campaign. It's been disproven in every way we can disprove this mm-hmm. sort of thing but it's that lingering fear that that goes on and to be honest the way our google searches go the way you know we might look up information there's still a lot of people who are advocating for that there's a number of american celebrities uh even canadian celebrities who have really spoken publicly about this link so this has led to distrust and of course during covid we've seen a lot of distrust during um about vaccines as well not helping this measles outbreak we definitely want to speak about that but you're right my kids are a little bit older now but i remember when they were really young getting these vaccines lots of people in our circles friends relatives were like well are you sure you want to do this you know what about Mm -hmm. autism this research says this and you're right it's been debunked in every possible way i believe it was retracted from whatever medical journal was initially published in but how do you overcome that? I guess you never really 100% can, right, Professor? No, you don't really, you can't really undo. And the problem is a lot of people think it's safer to do nothing than something. Mm -hmm. So if they're a little bit worried about that, you know, if they're a little bit unclear about what the data is, they feel like it's safer not to get their child vaccinated than to actually get them vaccinated. Now, the math doesn't add up Mm -hmm. (laughs) for that. The math is very clearly... Uh, supports getting vaccinated but we just have this human sort of innate instinct that it's safer to do nothing than something i think the other thing that is unique to this time and place in the canadian uh, ecosystem is we don't have enough family doctors which is where the vast majority of childhood uh, vaccinations go and family doctors are so overstretched that they if they have someone in their care who really needs to be talked through the safety of immunization and really needs to have a heart to heart because they have some concerns, they may not have time to do that. Mm -hmm. And again, that conversation is a long conversation, it's a difficult conversation, and it's not something that uh, you can get in your walk-in clinics or these places that people are having to access healthcare when they don't have a family doctor. It's a great point too, right? Because as a kid, I remember my family doctor, they kept track of all this stuff from yeah. myself, my siblings. That was like, you went to yeah. the office and they, and they had this on track. But with increasing amount of people not having a family physician or a primary care provider, that's definitely the case. Um, mm-hmm. I wonder, Professor, just speak, sticking with the vaccinations, this autism study that everybody talked about, this one that everybody, that's what everybody was worried about. How much did that play when COVID came around too? Is that still in the mm. people's minds or are there other things at play for the people who are, the, who are not into the vaccinations? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because when the COVID vaccines were first rolled out, of course it was adults before kids kind of thing. And uh, there there was some new misinformation that really, um, I think, I remember the first time I saw, again, a very organized, very cynical uh, misinformation campaign around fertility in kids and young people. And I thought, oh, 
I mean, it's terrible, but brilliant. Because if you're a parent, what's the one thing you want as grandchildren, right? And, and you know, the one thing that if you're a young person who's thinking about where you want your life to go and, you know, what the future is going to look like for you, what is that one sort of gut instinctual thing that's really going to trigger an emotional response? It's this myth about infertility. Mm-hmm. And in the COVID pandemic, I think that's one of the ones that really made a lot of parents pause. Um, and of course, we've disproven that every way. We've shown that actually COVID infections during pregnancy are pretty darn bad for mothers and babies, and babies can have long-term uh, health issues with that. We've shown in every way you can show that COVID is uh, vaccinations are safe during pregnancy. They're safe for people planning pregnancy. There was an increased risk of myocarditis in children, but we've now we're now not seeing that anymore. Um, so again, you know, but catching up and that, again, that instinctive fear that, well, you know, maybe COVID isn't so bad for young people, so it's safer to wait and let's, you know, make sure that there's no issues with their fertility 10 years, 15 years down the line is a pretty dangerous thing. But, you know, I cannot, you know, I, I, I can't, I'm not going to say this quite right, but I don't blame people for being worried if that's where they're getting their information and hearing because, you know, we all want to be grandparents one day and we all want our children to have, you know, happy uh, reproductive lives. So it's, you know, these really well-crafted misinformation messages hit the heartstrings in a way that fact after fact after fact have a hard time really about booking that emotional response. I can already feel the amount of emails we're going to get about that. <laughs> and we haven't even started talking yeah, about the anti-vaxxers. We haven't even started really getting into this yet, right? And I can only imagine you just wrote a, you, you write, you've write, read multiple pieces, but you just wrote a piece for the Global Mail a few weeks ago. Yeah. I can imagine you yourself have received a lot of emails or yeah, interesting messages. Yeah, what kind of stuff um, do you get, Professor? <laughs> Oh, gosh. Well, you know, I think I get sort of I I put them into two classes, you know, people who just think I should open my eyes and review the literature that they're reading that, you know, volcanoes cause COVID, not viruses (laughs) that, you know, it's all about air circulation and the government wants to see. And then people who are really kind of angry about it. And, you know, it's interesting. Again, you know, we are humans. Who have been programmed to have emotional responses to things as strongly and passionately as I believe that vaccines are safe and a good idea, I have to acknowledge that there's a class of people who feel strongly and passionately because of the information they receive uh, feel that that I'm doing the public a great disservice. And so I've had people, you know, write to my the chair of my department and the uh, <laughs> nonprofits I volunteer for and demand my resignation. I, it just goes <laughs> on. <laughs> wow. It, it has to be frustrating. I mean, we, we're, we're coming off of what, three and a half, four years of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and of course, anti-vaxxers became uh, mm-hmm. a very prominent term. Uh, it's got to be frustrating for you. What do you say to them? Yeah. Well, you know, I think with all good conversations, the key is listening, not talking, you know, and understanding that most one of the things that I'm so happy to be doing this podcast with you about is I really believe that there was once a time we were all getting the same news. You know, we didn't have so many options. You could stay up late and hear the 11 o'clock news. You read your local newspapers. You but we all got basically the same news. We might have different opinions about it. And of course, there's some variation about, you know, if your newspaper was more right or left or whatever. But now we have a world where many people don't use traditional media for a news source at all anymore. And if they are getting their news, they're on social media or that sort of thing. And I feel strongly and passionately (laughs) in legacy news because there's fact checking and you can't lie. Mm -hmm. Whereas on social media, you can lie to your heart's content and it's infotainment as opposed to, Mm -hmm. to news. And, you know, I've been a spokesperson for vaccines in Canada and things like that. And sometimes I get these emails by, you know, somebody I knew in grade school or somebody, you know, who lives on one of the coasts saying, hey, I just saw you on my YouTube thing, you pop up. But I know there are other people whose social media algorithms, including people, you know, in my own family, who have never fed them Mm -hmm. a clip of me speaking. (laughs) They have never seen any of that legacy news media uh, that I do that requires, you know, truthiness and fact checking Mm -hmm. and all this stuff. So to me, it's like, it's a bit of a symptom about how problematic this polarization of where we get our information is and the kind of information that I believe to be true that I, you know, the scientific community, that sort of thing. Again, it doesn't have that emotional impact Mm -hmm. (laughs) that some of the scary stories that happen uh, and some of these other sites happen. So uh, yeah, it's for me, it's really an education 
in about how fractured our society is becoming in many Absolutely. regards. Yeah, it is fascinating. This is why we love this podcast so much because we can have conversations like this, just full mm-hmm. lengthy discussions. And I could talk all day about this. I think the one, because we received a lot of feedback in our coverage of COVID and we, uh, it's a daily thing. I, I receive emails like this from people. And the big argument that they get angry about is, well, shouldn't this be a choice? This is a free mm-hmm. country. Shouldn't I be able to choose whether or not I get vaccinated or whether or not my children get vaccinated? It's not that simple, right, Professor? What do you say to people who say, well, come on, it's free country. Let me do what I want. So vaccines have always been kind of interesting because they walk the line between a public health decision mm-hmm. and a personal decision. Yeah. So, for example, you're not allowed to pollute the air, the water that somebody else is drinking. Mm-hmm. You're not allowed to do that because that's a public health decision. Mm-hmm. You're not allowed to run a kitchen that's full of typhoid fever. Yes. <laughs> you know, that is something you are not allowed to do because that's a public health decision. And so for some vaccines, we actually do treat it like public health. You're not supposed to be able to go to school without a vaccine record. Mm-hmm. You know, in my university at McMaster, when we were opening back up and having the residences, it turns out there were lots of public health rules on the book about the vaccines you need to live in a congregate setting mm-hmm. on a university campus. They just hadn't been enforced for a long time. Mm-hmm. So sometimes we treat vaccination like it's not a personal decision. It's part of living in a society. You're not allowed to infect other people. You're not allowed to put other people's health at danger. You must if you want to live at work or go to school in some of these settings. But (laughs) there are other aspects where we treat it as a personal health decision. Unless you're a healthcare worker, you probably don't have to get an influenza vaccine every year. Um, And we treat that like a personal health decision. So I think when COVID came along, we hadn't really, we'd sort of been a little bit lax in not letting, um, not adhering to some of the rules about when it's a public health decision. But I think COVID was a weird disease as well. You know, the fact that um, kids were not the one, unlike measles, were not the ones who were at the highest risk, really probably changed it in a lot of people's mind to less like a measles type thing where you have to keep school safe and more like the flu shot, especially because, uh, you know, after the very first wave, we couldn't guarantee 100 percent protection from systematic infection. So um, my personal, you know, um, as somebody who studies infectious disease and especially in vulnerable populations like older adults, I feel that my vaccine choices are, are actually a public health decision. I feel it's part of my responsibility to live in civil society, not to infect or put the people I care about at risk. Um, but other people have a very different metric for that. And uh, and I don't actually have a quick answer about how yes. to reconcile that. I do think healthcare workers, people who work in long-term care, you know, anyone who works with immunosuppressed people or sick kids or mm-hmm. anything like that, I do definitely think we should have some regulations about uh, vaccination in those populations. But the measles vaccine, for example, it's not absolutely mandatory, right? I don't have to get it, right? No. Now, most public school systems yeah. usually you have to have it. Yes. Many private school systems don't have that rule. Yes. Um, and you do definitely have to either have been vaccinated or show proof of immunity if in most healthcare uh, yes. setting. But you know that okay. it's yeah. tough because, like, if you're a janitor at a hospital, yes. How important is that for measles? It's actually probably pretty important. But for COVID, you know, how important is that? And I, we don't have good answers. And that's a nice segue, and I, don't, I know you wanted to talk about school boards yes. uh, that are enforcing it and taking you know it to the next level. So that's why I want to make sure our listeners and our readers understand that 100%. So a lot, all the school boards around Ontario have been warning people for months now that we're going to suspend your child if they're not A, vaccinated, or have some sort of exemption. So what actually is the rule, Professor? Do you, have to, you don't have to have this vaccine, but you have to have an exemption? How do you get an exemption? What are the rules? So exemptions come in two forms. So the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine is what we call a live virus Mm -hmm. vaccine. And one of the reasons it works so well is because it's a live virus vaccine. So it's like a weakened virus, um, which is great because you get vaccinated, your immune system thinks you're being infected and mounts this really, really strong response. So works really, really well. But there are some populations who shouldn't get live virus virus vaccines. Now they're very, very rare for young people. There's certain immunodeficiencies where you might be at a higher risk if you don't have an immune response that can deal with even a weak virus. But to be honest, those kids aren't going to be in the public school system Mm -hmm. um, probably at all. Um, There's also things for say teachers, you know, pregnant women should not get live. We don't allow them to get live virus vaccines. The data that it's unsafe is is pretty weak, but uh, we don't do that. We prefer that people get vaccinated before they get pregnant. Mm-hmm. 
So that's those are the two sort of classes of people that wouldn't normally be eligible for a live virus vaccine like measles. And then after that, the letter of the law is you need to show uh, your measles, mumps, rubella. Some jurisdictions allow like religious exemptions or other exemptions and some don't. Mm. And so that is where, you know, the fact that we have different public health units can interpret these things differently, uh, can make decisions. Uh, religious schools often have a different um implementation of that policy than public schools, which also makes it more complicated. But in general, you should definitely uh, expect that you need to show proof of that. Now, there's an, it gets more complicated, mm-hmm. of course. Yeah. There's nothing like <laughs> everything, in, yeah, everything does. Yeah. <laughs> in Canada, we have terrible records of vaccination. Mm-hmm. If you've ever tried to move province yes. and find your vaccine records, it's a nightmare. Most of us have a little yellow card. I, just, yeah, I remember those yes. little check yeah. marks. Yeah. Well, where, where, where is it? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where mine is. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> um, and then, of course, newcomers to Canada, often, t- t- especially if they're coming from a place that you know is disrupted by strife or war or whatever, often don't have that. And so the recommendation there is if you don't know a child's status, the National Advisory Council on Immunization just recommends they get vaccinated again. Mm-hmm. Nothing bad happens if you get extra vaccines, except you get extra protection. Yes. Um, but that's a real, it, you know, it's a not, it's a not a trivial challenge for some of the more metropolitan areas, which have a lot of immigrants from areas that don't have high vaccine yes. rates, because you know just the logistics of finding these people helping them get to a family doctor or make some decisions about their vaccine status, helping them track that down, means that it tends to be quite a slow process in in getting people up to date in these vaccines if they're not up to date. Yes. So I think in Guelph, for example, the school board there just suspended 1,300 kids. So mm-hmm. that's because A, they don't have proof that they had these vaccines or B, they didn't have some kind of exemption. Um, obviously, there's a lot of people who've been writing to us or are talking about how that's way too blunt of an instrument that you're just going to mm-hmm. have the what kind of how do you have the power to suspend all these people, all these kids at once? Um, what do you would you say to those people? Well, I think one of the things that like one of the public health 101 is bring the public health to the people. Mm. Why we don't have vaccine clinics in school Mm. to help busy parents out. Mm -hmm. Because again, I have so much sympathy for some of these parents because they probably called their family doctor who's like, ooh, I don't know what the rules Mm. are in our area. And a lot of like our pediatric sort of schedule is pretty clear, but where it gets a little bit murky is who's responsible for giving that vaccine Mm. if the child is 12 instead of five. Mm -hmm. Should it be the public health unit? Should it be the family doctor? The family doctor might have to call the public health unit and get some of the vaccine fit to them. Mm -hmm. You know, we we have had a huge demand on um, measles, mumps, rubella vaccines. The manufacturers have come in and said, we can get them to you, just give us a bit more time. So if a parent with like all the good intentions is trying to get their kids up to date with their vaccine. They're calling their family doctor mm-hmm. in the old province. They're, you know, they're trying to figure out and they can't, their family doctor's not being very helpful. Most pharmacies don't do young kids. Like bring the vaccine clinic mm-hmm. to those parents. <laughs> and that just, just helps to fuel all the people's misinf- all the misinformation too. The people are frustrated because they're like, well, it's not even easy to get. So yeah, yeah. that yeah. just adds to that, right? Yeah, it and, really and- does. Professor, we, we went through this with, with COVID uh, and we talk about s- supply. It was kind of up and down uh, mm-hmm. from time to time. Mm-hmm. Where are we with the uh, the supply of the uh, measles vaccination, uh, vaccination in Canada? How is the supply? So there's been a huge demand currently. And the last thing I read was that uh, there were some public health units that were having shortages of the, not as much as, and so trying to figure out who first. Now kids are always gonna go first and, and people who are planning to get pregnant are high priority. Um, but you know, different jurisdictions, like I said, have different makeups. There are, you know, one of the public health uh, unit directors in Montreal, I heard him on the CBC saying, we have a school with only a 30% vaccination rate. So if, and you know, measles spreads like wildfire. So it kind of makes sense to prioritize those really, really low vaccination rates and get to then get to that one kid in Guelph, (laughs) who, you know, maybe the one kid in their school who's not properly Mm -hmm. vaccinated, Mm -hmm. just, you know, it's an effective distribution of resources. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something we're kind of struggling with too. Now, all the suppliers have said, don't worry, we can ramp up. It's just, 
this has exceeded what Canada's demand is. And, you know, vaccine procurement and distribution in Canada is wild, really, because we have this National Advisory Council on Immunization who looks at the safety data and the health data and makes recommendations. And then each province um, makes their own decisions about when in the schedule, um, how many vaccines are they going to buy, how are they going to distribute them. Now, the pediatric vaccines are pretty stable. We're all pretty much on the same page about that. Adult vaccines, different provinces interpret them differently. But then each province traditionally goes out and buys a certain number of doses for those. So depending on you know, the politics of the province and what they're prioritizing and how good their data is about their vaccination rates might make their decision of how much vaccine they're buying insufficient. Mm -hmm. And that is, and then the province then has to decide to get them all the public health units and all that. And so even if you decided, okay, we're going to vaccinate those 1300 kids today, there's still a lot of trickle down to yes. to get the vaccines to the the community that takes yes. you know could take weeks. Yes, and are we talking? Uh, what are the other vaccines that kids have to have in, in, uh, before to not be suspended? It's not just the measles. So mumps, um, there's uh, the childhood vaccines. The measles, mumps, and rubella is probably the one that everyone agrees is really important. Um, and there's some other vaccines that are definitely recommended for kids, but you don't necessarily get suspended. So there's this one called uh, the pneumococcal mm -hmm. uh, vaccination. Super important. Biggest cause of meningitis in kids in the pre-vaccine era. And now we basically have like almost no deaths due to that but it's not super duper contagious mm -hmm. so it's that one falls more into the like good idea yes but mm -hmm. private uh, as opposed to that influenza as an example has been shown to be super effective at preventing community spread if you vaccinate kids but again that's not uh not part of the mandatory one um some of the the meningococcal b meningitis b another major cause of meningitis that one is highly contagious and you might have heard some news stories about um outbreaks of that where people have gone in and gave, given all the surrounding kids um uh boosters um so that one's a requirement as mm -hmm. well and uh and then we have the um uh, Tdap, which is the tetanus, diphtheria, uh, pertussis, and that one's really quite standard for mm. for kids. But I don't think that's one you can get expelled for. Professor, do you worry this is going to get a little bit ugly because you feel like as these school boards start to suspend more and more kids, there's going to be those people that dig their heels in and say, "No way am I getting my kid vaccinated." <laughs> I, I see court challenges ahead, some protests. Yep. I mean, this isn't going to be very easy, is it? No, and you know. <laughs> we learned through COVID that heavy handed hurts more than help. So, mm -hmm. you know, but it's a, it's a real challenge because public health has been woefully underfunded forever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's way quicker to send a letter to 13 kids, hundred kids and say, your kids are suspended than to call each family and say, let's have a talk. What's your particular issue? What mm -hmm, do you need? Mm -hmm. What information do you need? Do you need, you know, do you just need a map on where to go? Do you need me to talk you through the importance of this vaccine? Like what do you, need? and 1300 phone calls is out of our, economic yes so you know i think that trust in trust costs money mm -hmm. <laughs> it, and it takes time and what we're asking is our public health units to have to forego that community building um in order for expediency and i think that's a big problem yeah i appreciate it. professor we're almost finished thanks so much for all your time i guess the one question i want to ask you because i we get it all the time i always get the email that says you're not looking at the real facts. You're 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 not doing your job as a journalist. Look at the research that says all these kids that died from vaccines. Does that mm -hmm. research exist anywhere? Well, I will say that the best available evidence we has have say infectious disease always kills way more than vaccines. There are very rare occasional side effects that are that are serious. I don't know of any reliable source of evidence that say that children have died from vaccines, especially the COVID vaccines, which are so contentious. But I know that there were a lot of children who died of COVID. And again, we can look at medical records, we can look at hospital records and, and find those data. So the cost benefit, although, you know, as an immunologist, I will say there are always risks. There are risks for everything in life, including vaccination, but the cost benefit is, uh, you know, really profoundly on the, the vaccination side. Uh, professor, before we uh, let you go today, is there anything that we didn't ask you or talk about uh, that you'd like to bring up before we let you go? 
Well, we I talked so very much. I can't imagine that there's anything else. Excellent. I guess my only thing is remember pregnant women. If you're thinking about coming becoming pregnant, have a question, have a discussion about vaccination during and pre-pregnancy because it has such an important impact on babies and on the success of your pregnancy. Very well said, Dr. Don Bowdish from the. Uh, McMaster University, professor of medicine. Uh, great chat. As Frisco said, we could have sat here and talked uh, all day. Uh, now we look forward to the uh, the emails and phone calls. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for your time. We appreciate it today. Thank you so much. Take care. When you need a mortgage, the right choice can really save you money and stress. With True North Mortgage, you'll get your best rate better options, and timely advice to help you save thousands. Bring home your best mortgage today with experts you can trust. Reporters, editors, and journalists who go the extra mile to get the story and get it right. Go behind the scenes with those who cover the stories that matter most to you and your community. Look for it in the Village Features section of your favourite Village Media website across Ontario. Back to wrap on another episode of Inside the Village with Michael Friscalanti, Editor-in-Chief. Derek Turner is here. I'm Scott Sexsmith. Okay, I got to ask. It's been a couple of minutes since we broke for commercials. How many How many emails? <laughs> I heard some dings. There's been 48 emails. No, I'm just kidding. Well, we're not live, thankfully, because if yeah. we were live, we'd be a disaster. But uh, but yeah, they're, they're going to come. And like, I don't want to sound flippant. I understand that there are some people that are just concerned generally about mm-hmm. vaccines and then they hear different things. And there has been, as the professor so eloquently put it, there has been a lot of misinformation out there. And uh, the reality is some of that, w- even my generation dealt with, when we had kids, everyone in our circle that was having kids did talk about sure. that, that yeah. autism study, right? That really stuck with people that somehow vaccines were linked to autism. And even though that research has been debunked and it's been corrected 50 million times over, it still sticks with people, right? And so that's part of the issue. And so people are genuinely concerned, I think. So uh, you mentioned the uh, the suspensions uh, in the Guelph area and, and in the Algoma district. Do you see the potential for, because this is not going to go away quietly, I wouldn't think, mm-hmm. uh, is there potential for, for lawsuits and, and further discussions about choice and rights personally i don't think so just because if i if i recall accurately this these legislation has been on the table for decades so i'm sure it's been there's been arguments and challenges made about it in the in the past and like i said you don't have to get your vaccine you right. just have to have an exemption of some kind so you can tell get one from your doctor if you feel like you have other health issues that impact you don't want to get a vaccine if it's a religious choice you can get an affidavit sworn and saying that that's the reason so you don't have to get the vaccine so I would imagine that, say, here in the Sioux, if there's 4,000 families that are still getting these letters saying your child's going to be suspended on this particular day, the vast majority of them are going to try to get the vaccines because they'll be like, oh, it's just something happened. Maybe they don't have a family doctor. It's hard to get these vaccines. That's that's reality too, right? And so you might, and then you'll have the other people that say, no, I'm going to get an exemption. So I'll go to my lawyer or whatever, however you have to do that. And then you might still get the small minority who just want to dig their heels in and say, I'm not getting my kids vaccine, vaccinated. It's a freedom of choice. Well, for those people in the short term, they I think they have to get used to homeschooling. I think is the is the answer they're going to have to is they're going they're going to get because even if they challenge us, it would be a long time coming. It'd be months and months before a legal challenge was heard. And I, I haven't heard that that that's coming down the pipe. It's something to watch for, I suppose. But I guess we'll see. And and I think you're right. It is about choice and 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 the choice of whether or not you want to get the vaccination. But it's also about requirements. Mm-hmm. And if the requirement is that the child requires the vaccination to go to school, mm-hmm. then they have to conform and, and get the vaccination. Much like when we went through COVID. Yes. Uh, to get on an airplane, yes. you had to be vaccinated. Absolutely. If if you choose not to be vaccinated, well, you can't get on the airplane. Absolutely, and that's that's yeah. kind of how it's going to. So that, and that's kind of the rationale for public health. That's why we have public health a, a, yeah. public health agencies in this wonderful first world country of ours that that look out for what's in the public interest health health wise. And they decided decades ago that these childhood vaccines are critical to have in order to go to school to create that herd immunity and to and to get to help protect kids as much as possible. It seems rational to me. I got the vaccines. My kids have the vaccines. 
I understand it's not necessarily the way other people feel about it, but this is the way the rules are in place right now. And this is what's coming down the pipe. This is why we're having this conversation. Yep. I'm not trying to ram some opinion down people's throats. No, not at all. The reality is the public health agencies across Ontario are doing this. They're all trying to catch up. They were bogged down with COVID for four years. A lot of people weren't getting their childhood vaccines. A lot of kids are way behind. So now they're trying to catch up. This is happening. And so we're talking about it. And thankfully, we live in a world where we're given choices and we're allowed to make those choices. Mm -hmm. And this is one. Another one is you have the choice to reach out to us and tell us what you think about the measles vaccination. ITV at villagemedia.ca. We would love to hear from you. You can also uh, catch uh, any and all back episodes at insidethevillage.ca or wherever you get your favorite podcasts across the Village Media Network. For Michael Friscalanti, Editor-in-Chief here at Village Media, Derek Turner, the guy who does the heavy lifting that puts this show together each and every week. Uh, Derek, thank you. I'm Scott Sexsmith. Have a great week. We'll talk to you next week. You've been listening to Inside the Village. Frisco and Scott's wardrobe, provided in part by Moore's Sault Ste. Marie.